Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our virtual talk about the Southern Wildlife Rehab Center. I'm so glad you could join us today. So um, before we get started with Michelle Kamara, Denise was going to talk to you about the Phil Hardberger Park Conservancy. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm glad you could join us today for this virtual program. Um, I am the executive director of the Phil Harberger Park Conservancy, and uh, we are a member-based nonprofit that supports okay. Phil Harberger Park and helps to bridge the gap between um, our San Antonio community and yeah. nature with these free uh, nature programs that normally take place in person in the park, but right now we're doing this. And uh, we also protect the natural habitat of Phil Harberger Park through advocacy, fundraising, and promotion. So if you enjoy the programs that um, the Conservancy offers, if you just want to be a part of preserving the park and um, making it always a natural place here for our citizens, then um, we invite you to support the Conservancy through donations or becoming a member. And you can learn more about that on the website where you registered for today's program, um, www.philharbourgerpark.org. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy the program this morning. All right, so this talk will be recorded and shared on our website. So please do turn off your videos and mute your microphone and that will help us reduce the background noise. So today we have Michelle Kamara to talk to us about the Southern Wildlife Rehab Center. Michelle is the owner of the Southern Wildlife Rehab Center and she works with all kinds of animals in need of rehabilitation, many of which we will meet today. All right, Michelle, the floor is yours. Okay, hi everybody. Um, like she said, <laughs> I'm Michelle Kamara. I own Southern Wildlife Rehab and um, what I do is wildlife rehabilitation and human education. So if animals are sick or injured, um, they come to the facility and I get them better. Uh, sometimes they're orphans, they lose their parents and we get them better and get them back out into the wild. Sometimes these animals don't get better and we keep them as uh, wildlife ambassadors. So that's some of the animals that we have here today with me. Um, should I go ahead and proceed? Okay, sounds good. Absolutely. Okay, okay so um, I've, I've brought, um, we'll actually, I'm, I'm on my laptop, so we'll go outside in a little bit and meet some of the tortoises and things like that. But right now we're gonna talk about some mammals. And what I'll do is I'll cover um, some of the mammals and then you can ask questions after I, like I, I'll cover like bats and ask you if you have any questions about bats and things like that. So that's how I'll proceed with this. Um, so let's actually, let's go ahead and start with bats. Okay, so uh, San Antonio is, uh, the, is known for the largest population of bats in the world. We have more bats than any other animal in the world here. And we have more of them than anybody has as far as mammals go. So we have over 2 million bats that live in a place called Bracken Cave. Bracken Cave, um, here, let me turn this light out behind me because it seems like it's overwhelming. Sure, go ahead. Let's see if that's a little bit better. Yeah, that should be better. Because all you're seeing is light, it seems. Okay, so Bracken Cave has over two, uh, two million bats in it. Those bats in that cave eat up to 55 elephants of bugs every single night. And that's a lot of bugs. Um, so I'm gonna show you uh, some of the bats that live in this cave. And that's going to be, um, they're Mexican free-tail bats. They like to live in colonies, they like to live in caves, and the boys and the girls live separate. The boys don't live with the girls. The girls all live at Bracken Cave, and it's called a maternity colony, so it's all babies and um, females. So I'm gonna bring them up really close. You can see them. And there's his little tail. So he's got a free tail. It's outside of his body. So it's not in his, in the area around his butt, it's not closed in there. So that's why it's called a free tail. And this is, who is this? This is Angus. So Angus actually came to me 
about six years ago. So he's been with me a long time. Mexican free tails live a really, really long time. They live about 20 years. Um, they like to live in caves and then they'll come out about eight o'clock at night and eat all the bugs. Does everybody see them really good? Yeah. So they look like little puppies. So we call them sky puppies. Okay, so let me get another bat and it's gonna be another free tail. Let me see who else do we have in here. Uh, maybe Batman. So they live, I have them in this little carrier to carry them, but they're so small they can actually hide. Let's see. So does anybody know what echolocation is? Let me see if anybody's got, that's a question for um, the audience. Let's see. Okay, so if you know what echolocation is, go ahead and type it into the chat at this time. There you go. Let's see. Does it pop up? Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on the chat for us. Anybody okay. know what echolocation is? It's okay if you don't, because I'll tell you. That's the good part about that. Okay, so thank you. Oh, there you go. Good, good. Good job. Let me see. The ability to move through space using sound vibrations. Perfect. Did you Google that really fast or did you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly what they do. Um, they, they yell. And so they have crevices around their face. So if you notice pictures of bats, they always have different crevices around their face. Fruit bats don't have this because they don't use echolocation. They don't have to, to eat fruit. They can find the fruit, they can see the fruit. But um, the uh, free tails, they'll fly through the air and they will, this one is Batman. And they're, actually they're both missing the same wing, which is kind of interesting. Let me see, let me put a light on him so you can see him good. Um, so Batman's on TV a lot. So say they're chasing a bug through the sky and they're 10,000 feet up and they're trying to catch that bat and they've got to decide where that bat is. So that's why they yell and try to find out which way the direction that the bat is going. I mean, the bug is going so they can catch it. Um, if we didn't have bats, we wouldn't have, let's see if that works. There's your close up, Batman. Yeah. <laughs> he says, I'm so used to being on TV. Yeah, they're hungry right now. We haven't had brekkie. So actually, Michelle, do you uh -huh. know how they lost their wing? Batman actually came in without his wing. Um, I don't, he was found by uh, a door jam and cats. Now, Angus actually had a broken wing and I actually took off the wing. So I do my own surgeries on my bats. Um, there we do, I do a lot with the zoo vet, but the zoo vet doesn't know anything about insectivore bats. So um, I'm, I kind of train people on how to uh, take care of insectivore bats in this area. And I learned that from a place called Bat World, which is up by Fort Worth. And they train people how to be bat uh, caretakers. And that's what I do. So I'm basically in charge of the largest population of bats in the world. So I'm their only one that uh, takes care of them in this area which is kind of cool. I actually think that's a wonderful thing I get to do now. Okay. That's great. Um, so and the thing about the free tail bats, uh, they, they are the fastest mammal in the world. Probably nobody knew that. They probably always thought it was a cheetah or things like that, but it's actually a Mexican free tail bat. They can get over 70 miles an hour if they catch the right wind and they can fly really high. They can get over 10,000 feet in the sky. So what Mexican free tails will do, the ones here from San Antonio, will fly all the way to Corpus Christi, to those farmlands that are around Corpus Christi and eat things called corn husk moths. So the corn husk moths eat all our produce out there. If they didn't eat all the bugs off the produce, we would have to put a lot of poison on the produce and we wouldn't be able to eat it. We'd get really sick from eating that produce. So we need bats to eat those bugs off of our produce. The most important animals in the world are bees and bats. Without these two creatures, we'll never survive. So we're really, really dependent on bats. Um, there's over 1,400 species of bats in the world. Um, there's uh, quite a few of them are fruit bats, 
but then we have ones that will eat the bugs. Then we have ones that will actually eat frogs. We have ones that will eat fish. We have ones that will eat blood. We have ones that eat nectar. So there's all kinds of different types of bats. But in America, we have about 45 species of bats and uh, they all eat bugs. We don't have any of the ones that drink blood and we don't have any of the ones that eat fruit down here. Now on the Mexican border, we have ones that do eat nectar and it's called a, a long snout, snouted uh, bat. And they're kind of look like a fruit bat. They're really, really pretty and they're big, but um, we don't have uh, any of the other types of bats like the uh, vampire bats, those live in South America. So we don't have to worry about them. And actually uh, vampire bats are not scary. They, they like chicken blood, blood and cow blood. So they really don't like humans anyway, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so before I move on to the next species, any bat questions? Okay, at this time, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat. Or if you'd like to turn on your mic, just turn on your video and indicate to us that that's what you're going to do. Okay, so, so let's move on. Um, what we'll do is let's go out and see tortoises and then we'll come back and see the other animals that are in here. Okay, so we're gonna walk, which is so nice about having a laptop. And so we we'll go out to the facility area. So my facility area back there is a beaver habitat. And then over here is the uh, tortoise habitat. And on the other side of the yard is actually a coyote habitat and foxes too. We put foxes in there also. So I'm gonna set you down here. Okay, we've got various types of tortoises. Let me just take you into the tortoise area. Let me just take you with me. Okay, so uh, we have at, at our facility, the second large, uh, third largest tortoise in the world, um, which uh, species, it's not the largest one, mine isn't. But this is called a sulcata. He's the African spurred tortoise. That's Linus. He'll actually get about 200 pounds. So the largest is the Galapagos. The next largest is the Aldabra. Then the third largest is going to be the uh, sulcata. And Linus is a baby. He's only six years old. He's about 40 pounds. And so he's going to grow and grow and grow. Okay, and we have Texas tortoises here. These are all Texas tortoises. <laughs> you can see that. Yeah, you can. Good job. So Texas tortoises are a threatened species. Um, the problem with Texas tortoises, if you take them out of the wild, they develop a bacteria and they can't release them in the wild. So none of these tortoises really have issues but they just can't be back and out in the wild because somebody decided to try to keep them as a pet. Tortoises are actually very gentle, gentle animals. And so everybody thinks because they're gentle, they wanna be your friend, but really that's not true. It's just, they're little and you're big and they just are friendly. Okay, so this is uh, Roxy. Roxy has been with us probably the longest out of the Texas tortoises. She was abused. Somebody decided to paint her shell. The problem with painting shells is that it's poisonous and it also can prevent her from absorbing certain vitamins. Fortunately, they only did some painting on her and it's starting to wear off. We can't remove that paint, but it's poisonous. It has something in it that gives her uh, runny noses. We call those upper respiratory infections. And then she also gets tumors. So we have to examine her every once in a while and sometimes she gets a tumor, which is kind of like uh, a cancer thing, but doesn't kill her. So we just get it removed and um, she's okay afterwards. So eventually this paint will wear off. The interesting part is the paint that she has on her actually glows in the dark. So whoever had her tried to keep her as a pet and put the uh, paint on her, I guess, so they could find her in the day or the night. And she's been abused a lot. She's been, she's missing parts of her shell. Their, their shell is actually a backbone. And so if the shell is damaged, it won't grow back. It's a bone. And so it doesn't replace itself. Okay, so I'm gonna show you uh, a diff difference between a tortoise and a turtle. And I want you to tell me which one's the turtle and which one's the tortoise. 
Okay. Michelle, will that paint on her shell have any long-term effect on her health? Yes, it gives her uh, tumors all the time and the uh, upper respiratory infections. And if she had a lot of paint on her, she would die because she wouldn't be able to absorb vitamin D from the sun. They don't get uh, certain vitamins from food. They actually have to get it from sunlight. Most reptiles are like that. They actually have to have real sunlight on them to be healthy. Wow. And, and then yeah, we had a question. A question, go ahead. Yeah, a question from Meredith. What should a person do if we find a tortoise in the road that's been hit by a car but is still alive? Call me. Okay. Southern Wildlife Rehab. Yeah. I specialize in tortoises. Now, turtles, um, I will take them, but I take the turtles over to wildlife. Oh, you know what? You're breaking up just a little bit. Because I'm not really good at turtles, but tortoises. Yep. Sorry. Mm. Okay. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, that's okay. That's sorry, because I'm outside. Okay, I'm away from my my um, internet. Okay, so we've got this animal that looks like a tortoise. He doesn't swim in the water. He doesn't have webbed feet. He looks like a tortoise. He's rounded. Their shells are rounded. But this is actually a turtle. This is actually an ornate box turtle. And um, I'm going to let you guys guess what the difference between a turtle and a tortoise is. And I want three guesses, okay? Can you guys tell me something? Okay, I want you to voice your votes in the chat, everybody. What's the difference? What's the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? I'll give you a hint. You're probably not going to guess till I tell you. But I'd like to see what your guesses are. Nobody? <laughs> Here we go. I think it's that tortoises That's close. walk on land. But they both walk on land. Andrea says tortoises live longer. Nope. Mm. William here is 30 years old. He's going to live to be about 120. Roxy's going to live to be about 60. Denise asks, is it their size? Nope. Nope. There are different sizes. You can get a snapping turtle one of those big alligator snapping turtles and he'll be bigger than linus they're really really big hmm. the difference is what they eat so tortoises are herbivores that means they only eat plant matter turtles are what's called omnivores like us we're omnivores so we eat plant matter and meat so william likes to eat bugs and fish and all kinds of stuff that he can get the hold of um okay, let, me, let me put roxy back real quick So William is actually full grown. This is as big as he's going to get. He's well over 30 years old. He came in because there was two dogs playing with him like he was a rock and they were throwing him around and they punctured his shell and they damaged it. So when they took off this outer part of the shell, let me put that closer, that's never going to come back. And then there's the puncture and it's never, never really going to heal normal. And we actually have a tortoise in there. Uh, uh, that um, has injuries that she must have sustained long before we ever got her. And we call her Scarlet because they're really, really, really bad uh, scars on her back. But William here is an ornate box turtle. And the reason I know it's a boy is because see his eyes are red. The ornate box turtles that are female have brown eyes. So that's how I know that this is a boy. So William, do you want to say hi to everybody? <laughs> Are their eyes ever a color besides brown or red? Not on the ornate box turtles. Okay. Yeah, and you can get like yellow. It's, it depends on the species. So it could, be, um, it could be yellow eyes or all kinds of stuff. Okay, let's go back into the mammals. Does anybody have any tortoise questions or turtle questions as I'm heading in? Okay, does anyone have any questions? Go ahead and voice them in the chat. 
that's a good thing about Zoom. You can wash your hands in between. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Okay, we've got a question. Right. What types are native to Texas? Oh, we have a lot in Texas because Texas is such a big, big state. I couldn't even list them all. Um, and sometimes I get ones that aren't from Texas, but have been here a long time. So are there any that out. are most common? Um, probably the uh, uh, sliders, the, the uh, yellow eared or red eared sliders. They'll even have yellow on the side, but they're a turtle. And you'll see those in a lot of the waterways. Um, and it depends on what, what part of Texas you're in. Like if you're out in the desert, you're gonna see desert tortoises and gopher tortoises. But if you're over by the beach, you're probably gonna see more of the um, sliders or in the forest, you're gonna see uh, ornate box turtles like William. And then there's also a called a three-toed uh, box turtle. And they're, they, their skin is red and they're really, really pretty. So when you see these tur turtles and tortoises in the wild and they're so pretty, let them be in the wild because the problem is they have special diets and when you take them home and stuff them into an aquarium it's really not nice when they had a whole forest to themselves and then you're just going to stick them in an aquarium and feed them whatever you want where they used to be able to eat whatever they wanted to before and go wherever they wanted to so taking away their freedom is not very nice um, an example is the texas tortoise that's actually a threatened species in the 70s uh, there used to be big roundups of those for pets because everybody wanted them as pets. Uh, just like the ones you get in the pet store that come from other countries. And they're basically doing the same thing. Um, the problem is when they took all the Texas tortoises from the wild, basically, um, the population dwindled and we don't have enough to eat prickly pear. Their main diet is prickly pear. So now we're overrun with cactus because we don't have enough Texas tortoises to eat it. So that's the problem whenever you start removing things from the wild, you start messing up how things should be, and then everything is not healthy anymore because you've removed something that needs to be there. Um, the, oh, one more thing. Okay, when they're crossing the street, you, if you see somebody crossing the street, you're gonna make them go in the direction they're going in that. You can get them out of, uh, you know, into safety away from cars, but don't put them the opposite direction. Put them in the direction they were going in because they're gonna turn around because they already know where they were going. Um, if you see one in the wild, in the forest or something like that, don't touch them. Just admire them from the distance because their defense is to run, to hide, you know, pull in. But the other defense is actually to pee. It's called dropping water. So when they drop their water, they'll pee everything in their body. So if they can't replenish that, um, they'll actually dehydrate. And the reason they do this is so the predators will actually drink it and, you know, quench their thirst while they run off. So that's, that's why they do that. So they don't have a whole lot of defenses. They can't really fly through the air and rip anybody's throats out. So tortoises are pretty defenseless. It's easy for anybody to just go grab one and pick it up. So just leave them alone in the wild, okay? All right, ready for another animal? Yeah? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sounds good. I'm gonna save the two best ones to the end. So we're gonna do a new possum that just joined our, our program. She hasn't been named yet, um, but um, she's really, really sweet. We've discovered, she, we've got 17 possums in, and um, we've discovered that she loves to be with people. So we're gonna go ahead and keep her. We have some that are coming in this weekend that actually have some health issues. So they'll be joining us. They're missing uh, legs and arms, and they're supposed to be really sweet. Now, uh, what's interesting about possums is um, they're a marsupial. A marsupial is different than the regular animals that we have here. They're like from the kangaroo family. So they actually have a pouch in their belly where the babies uh, grow. And then later they'll go on mama's back. And then, then as mom walks, the babies will fall off and they'll just kind of do their own thing. Um, so when they're born in the pouch, born and go into the pouch, they're born premature. So they're not even formed. They're really, really, really small. And so they actually don't even have a belly button. A marsupial, a marsupial doesn't have a belly button. I know that sounds really weird, but it's because they don't depend on growing in mom's belly to get bigger. What they want to do is drink milk to get bigger. So that's why they don't have a belly button. They don't need it. They actually drink the milk to get bigger. 
and develop. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing about uh, marsupials. Um, marsupials also have a very fast metabolism. So uh, they have a low body temperature. Uh, their body temperature is 93 to 95 degrees. So because of that, they can't get certain diseases like parvo, distemper, or rabies. Um, there, you have to have a body temperature of 98 degrees or higher in order to be able to get these particular diseases. And so marsupials really can't get um, rabies. There's been some studies on this and they were able to infect uh, possums with rabies in a laboratory setting, but that's the only way they were able to do it. There's never been one found in the wild with rabies. Um, so because they don't have diseases, um, People like to have them in their yards. The other thing about them is they like to um, eat rattlesnakes. So if a rattlesnake actually were to bite this little girl, it wouldn't affect her. She'd get holes and it would hurt, but the venom is not going to affect her. So she actually will eat the snake. And the other thing that she loves to eat is ticks. So they like to eat a lot of ticks. You will never find a tick on a healthy possum ever. They love to eat ticks. They'll eat all the ticks in your yard and if they're immune to Lyme disease. So there are actually some studies on uh, possums to see why they don't get Lyme disease. It's probably because they're a marsupial. Um, so they're trying to find a vaccine for Lyme uh, or some type of uh, therapeutic benefits for humans because of the fact that they just don't get, I keep turning around so you can see her and she keeps going further back. <laughs> Come here, honey. So anyway. So we have a, a comment from Meredith. She uh -huh. says, Possums are my favorites. I used to think they were terrifying when they hiss, but now I know they have almost no defenses. That's right. In fact, their defense to hiss is because they have 52 teeth, which is more teeth than any other mammal in North America. So what they're going to do is show you their biggest features. So they show you all their teeth, get all drooly ugly. I personally call that the ugly contest. So if they're really, really ugly, you're going to leave them alone. At least that's what they hope. If they really look terrible and nasty, you'll go away. But if that doesn't work, the only th other thing they'll do is faint. And it's actually a chemical reaction and they can't control it. And they'll actually get stiff. So if some uh, predator is beating them around, they get less broken bones. So it's kind of interesting that, that they can't control that. Um, and they can't wake up. She, she's ready for brekkie. You want brekkie too? I got snappy here. This is somebody else's snack, but she can have some of it. She can have a little bit of this. Here, honey. Mm. So they have little hannies. There you go. <laughs> so they actually will put the food in their mouth with their hands like little monkeys. And if you notice her tail going around my neck and stuff, she uses that for balance. Here, here's some more. There we go. Remember, if you have any questions about possums, go ahead and um, put them into the chat and I'll be happy to voice them for you. Yeah, see all those teeth she has? Now, mom possum does not train these babies how to hunt or anything. They already know. So if a baby falls off mom, they're good to go. They already know what to do. They don't need mom to take care of them. Mom is not going to come back and help them. So they don't have a, a bond with their mother like some animals do. Um, what else is interesting? Oh, in the colonial days, whenever the, we first came to America, she wants more. Uh, the Indians introduced possum magic to the colonials. Possum magic was when they fainted. So the Indians thought that they were magical because they could faint. So they started mimicking that behavior. So what they would do is they would play dead in their villages when the enemy would come. And when the enemy would look around and think everybody's dead, they would jump up and attack them. So they thought that that was very magical that the Indians, that the uh, possums showed them this. So they shared that with the, uh, the first Americans that came here or the first, uh, the first settlers. There we go. That's a good way to put it. Okay. Before I move on, any other possum questions? Any or more input? questions? Go ahead and voice them in the chat. 
Hold on, I'll give you one more piece. Mm. Yeah. I'll show everybody how you eat. <laughs> She's letting the juice run down her throat. Okay, when she's done eating that, I'm going to pull out the other animals. You're going to love them. And then I'm going to close with a very unique animal that nobody ever uses for education because they're difficult to take anywhere. But because we have Zoom, that makes it perfect for you to meet this particular animal. Okay, let's put her back. And she's about six months old, by the way, six to, um, yeah, about six months old. Possums grow their whole lives, and they're also a very short-lived animal. They only live um, two to four years, so this is because their metabolism so fast. Okay, so we've got somebody that wants to meet you. This is Klondike. Klondike is a beaver. So we have, uh, he's a rodent. He's actually the second largest rodent in the world. Um, and and uh, he's a, also the largest rodent in North America. They're used a lot for fur because their fur is actually very thick, very soft and waterproof. So when he goes in the water, it, it protects him actually, the water, uh, fur. And see his little handies there? That's for swimming. Let's see, show him your teeth, baby. No drooling. <laughs> I'm sorry, he tends to drool. I don't know why. <laughs> I can't believe you just did that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Klondike does that. Um, Klondike, uh, we don't have beavers in San Antonio. He came from uh, up north, up by Dallas. Um, he was passed around as a pet, uh, as a little kid, and he's very, very into people, loves to be held, loves to uh, come up to you and stuff, so we can't release him in the wild, so he has to stay with us. So let me show you his back feeties. They're very big and webbed, so he can swim. Come here, feeties, baby. Mm -hmm. And then he's got that big tail. And it actually feels kind of rough. Uh, see, he had a, it sustained an injury as a little kid. We're not sure how he ended up in captivity to start with. But yeah, this tail, it's very, very strong. And so they use that to slap the water and scare away enemies, but they use it for um, swimming and they'll hit you with it too. <laughs> I got hit across the face the other day by our other beaver, and I thought my nose was broken because it was hard. But it just happens sometimes because that's what they do. Okay, so let's see if Klondike wants to eat. The other thing about um, Klondike is he has a... <laughs> okay, let's put you over here so everybody can watch you eat. You want to go over here and eat? Michelle, is there a reason he drools so much? So I think he's teething. <laughs> he drools a lot. Every time I hold him, my sleeve gets wet, and he'll go to sleep and drool. I don't know why. It's really funny. Okay, so we can watch him eating. There we go. So they have actually a um, musk gland in their uh, butt area, kind of like a skunk. And it's very, very... Um, important in some perfumes and some other stuff. It's called castor. And so they actually use that. It's very, very expensive and worth a lot of money. So unfortunately, beavers have everything going for them as far as uh, being used by humans, but not in the way that they should be alive. Now alive, what they've done is they've been able to make sure areas get water that didn't get water before, they build dams. They build these dams as houses to make themselves some areas that there's not so much air, not so much flowing water, so that that way they can get 
you know, things organized and store them and things like that. So that's why they block off these areas. Uh, a dam actually has, oh, he didn't want us to see. A dam actually has two doors. They have a way to get out uh, on the water area and they have a way to get out on the land area. And they do that in case somebody comes into their dam, into their house and they have to escape. So they have a front and back door. Um, beavers have very, very, very hard teeth. Um, what they do is they use that to eat wood. He actually will eat wood. He eats the area in between the bark and the wood and they love the way that tastes. And then he also likes to have the wood to chew his teeth and uh, grind them down because like I said, he's a rodent. So his teeth grow the whole time. So he's always having to wear them down. So that's very important for him to be able to have some hard wood to uh, chew on. And what he's eating is like a, I think it's like a plum or something. But they, they're um, herbivores. And that's all they eat is plant matter. They don't eat fish. They don't eat crawfish or anything like that. They're herbivores. So they're a rodent. And that's all that they do is eat plant matter. Let's see, there's his back feet. And they make the cutest noises. <laughs> Michelle, what happens if they don't have anything to chew on? Their teeth will continue to grow and it actually can kill them. It will grow into their heads. So they have to actually have stuff to chew on. And um, okay. we get squirrels that have that happen to them. It's called malclusion. And sometimes the teeth will grow wrong. And if it grows wrong, then they, that's a problem also. Um, wow. let's see, what's our time at? It is 9.39, so we have about 20 minutes. Okay. Um, uh, about beavers, what's interesting about the beavers? If you have any questions about beavers, go ahead and put them in the chat. No questions about beavers? Are you serious? You never see beavers. <laughs> you got to have a question. <laughs> How fast can they swim? Pretty fast, because I actually put these guys in my pool and uh, when Brooke's there, I can't catch her. She takes off like a maniac. Uh, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's crazy. Is there a reason that they make so many noises or do we not really know? No, we don't know. And actually the porcupines are the same way. And actually the nutrients, a lot of the rodents make a lot of verbalizations. And like in his case, you could tell that he's complaining. That's obviously a complaint noise he's making. Don't take my plum. <laughs> Um, but he's always, he's always going, ah, ah, ah. now Brooke barely makes a noise, but he's, he's a big talker, um, which is kind of cute because it sounds really cute. <laughs> what else about the beavers? Um, Can you tell us about their fur? It's, uh, very thick. Uh, it's got, um, let's see, let's go back over and see him. And let's, let's get a light on him so you can see deeper into his fur. <laughs> He's like, Mom, <laughs> eating here. Okay. So, so you can see his skin under there, but it's really glistening, soft, soft, silky fur. Hold still, Klondike. There we go. Uh oh. Um, so he's really, really, really soft. He's really strong, very thick animal, very sturdy animal. But uh, the, the hair doesn't soak up um, water. It repels water. So it's, it's not like our, our hair, where our hair will actually get really, really wet. You, if he's in the water and you just go like that, the, the water is gone. So it's very interesting. I see his tail again. And then we yeah, have a question big, that's from a baby Denise. Tail. Okay. She asks, are you able to replicate their habitat to provide water? Yes. Yes. We actually have a really nice habitat for them that has a waterfall um, and they have a pond area, but they haven't made any attempts to make any dams. They're kind of lazy beavers, these ones. Um, so they just sleep in like a little hut because 
I guess that's what they want to do. But eventually, I'm hoping they'll actually make some attempts to uh, build a dam and stuff. We've provided enough wood for them to be able to do that. Uh, uh, Klondike likes to, I will, I'll let him loose in the facility, and he'll build a dam with, like, plastic things. He goes around, picks up things, and then puts it all in the middle of the floor. But he just leaves it there. He doesn't make any attempts to do anything with it. He just drags it, leaves it, keeps putting everything in a pile. <laughs> So yeah, it's kind of funny. I'm trying to think, there was another, uh-oh, I just heard the plum hit the floor. Let me go get the plum. <laughs> if you have any more questions about any of the animals we've seen so far, go ahead and put them in the chat. Okay. So we have two more to go. No questions? Okay, so this one may blow your mind a little bit. Because um, I do a lot of animals. I've been doing this a long, long time. And this particular species I've been doing for over 30 years. This is one of my favorite animals. I love all the animals, but this is like one of my special favorites. This is, this is Max. So Max is a striped skunk. Max can spray. His spray glands are right here. I've actually got my fingers around his glands and he could spray at any time. And they're pretty big. I mean, that's a lot of juice on each side right there. Skunks are really, really unique animals. Um, they really don't have many predators. Uh, one of their big predators is the uh, great horned owl. And that's only if they were like little bitty skunks. Nobody's going to be attacking Max in the wild. Every animal in the world is afraid of a skunk. Right, Max? Skunks are the kings of the forest. All he has to do is show up, and the reason being is because of his colors. They purposely have these bright colors. So to, this is their first defense, is their colors. They show up, everybody leaves, and they won't even discuss it. <laughs> they say, Max just ruined the party. He showed up. And so they'll leave. If Max has to spray them for defense, he will. Um, but that's the only time they spray is if they're in fear of their lives. Um, they, they'll stamp. They'll do little cartwheels and just have their hair. And that's usually enough to make everybody leave and let them have whatever they want. We have five species of skunks in Texas. Um, you probably didn't know that. You probably thought there was only one kind of skunk. Max is what's called a striped skunk, which is the most common. Then we have a hooded skunk that looks just like the striped skunk, but around the neck, there's actually like coarse fur, and they're more on the coastal area. And then we have um, what's called a hognose skunk, and they kind of live more in West Texas. And then we have the um, spotted skunk, but there, there's an Eastern and a Western. So there's two species of that and they actually have different spots basically. Uh, they're similar, very close, it's hard to tell them apart, um, but the, the spots are different on those. And those are little bitty guys like this and they're the ones that do the cartwheels and the handstands and will walk with their feet up in the air. Um, Max can't do that. Max is so big he won't be able to do anything like that. Nice. Pull this down so you can see Max more. There we go. So Max is a big boy. He's, uh, he's in captivity. He's been with us for three years. Um, he was found by an extermination company and they wanted to keep him as a pet. And I had to explain to them that it's illegal to keep any wildlife in Texas as a pet. Um, and you can't take it over the state lines either. That's a federal crime. So uh, they ended up giving me Max. And so Max has been with us ever since. I don't descent my skunks on purpose because I don't see any point of you learning anything about a skunk if you think he can't spray you. If you learn that you can be around a skunk and he won't spray you, then you've, that's what I want you to learn. You can give them respect and give them their space and you don't have to worry about it. Because um, everybody, they just see a skunk and they freak out and that's not the way it should be. You should be able to learn how to give every animal respect and not just skunks and that's the way it should be. Um, skunk Uh huh. We have a question from Meredith. Sure. She asked, do skunks vocalize? Yes, they do. They'll scream, um, they'll chatter, they'll growl. 
Um, they're not big on talking. They, they're not talkers like the uh, beavers are, but they do make a lot of noise. Um, when they're fighting, they'll, they'll yell, you know, things like that. But mostly they're just lumps like Max. <laughs> Um, Max does a lot of stuff on TV too. So yeah, let's get you closer so they can see you, Bubba. He he's pushes in tight whenever I hold him. So, so How much does he weigh, Michelle? He's about thirteen pounds. Let's see his handies. So that's for digging. They use those claws for digging for bugs in the um, in the uh, wild. Oops, how to do that. Uh oh, where'd my mouse go? I don't know how to get that away. Um, they dig for, the, uh, for bugs. They'll tear up wood to get to bugs. They love bugs. That's their favorite thing. Um, they're also immune to snake venom. A lot of animals in the wild in, that are native to North America are actually um, immune to snake venom um, because over time, if they didn't develop that immunity, there they would the snakes could wipe everybody out because of their bites. And there's so many snakes. So they, the, these animals have adapted to be able to eat those snakes. Um, and we have another also, question. Sure. Meredith asks, is it bad to put out vegetable scraps or cat food for wildlife in an urban setting? It's actually illegal, but people do it anyway. State of Texas says you're not supposed to do that. Um, Texas Parks and Wildlife, they do not feed wildlife, but you know, people do it anyway. So you're, you're not supposed to, but in an urban setting, you know, when the animals don't have access to a lot of food, my suggestion is to plant uh, vegetables and stuff and have it be the wildlife garden and, and put a water feature in it. So that way they'll have water all the time. And that's technically not feeding if they're uh, taking it themselves. And so that's how you can do that. And then you can actually put the scraps in the uh, garden for compost for your plants. And if, you know, then the animals can have access to it too. And that's what I suggest. And then you're not doing anything wrong. Uh, so a lot of people around here actually now plant for wildlife. I personally plant for wildlife too. So I've got grapes and grapefruits and anything I plant in my yard is food related. I don't see the point in putting, um, or, uh, ornamentals in, I put in food. Um, oh, colonials again. Now, the reason I know all about the colonials is because I do a program on colonials. And it, in North America has a lot of its own special animals. Everybody thinks Australia only has their own special animals. Well, North America does too. Skunks are only from, oh, he's, yeah, I'm, I found the itchy spot. <laughs> so he's gnawing me. <laughs> Did I get the good spot? Why does he gnaw you when you scratch that spot? Because it feels good. He's feeling me. You know the way the dog's back foot goes? He does that too. <laughs> good. Yeah, maxi poo. So you see that snout? That's for digging in holes and sticking it in there. That's not for biting. Like I said, I mean, their teethies are small. They have teeth like cats, but they're really small. So they're not for defense. So his defense is his hair and his spray. Otherwise, he's really not going to be able to do much else. So when the colonials came, the Indians actually had skunks as pets because we didn't have cats in North America. That's an invasive species. Um, so the Indians actually use skunks because they like to eat mice and rattlesnakes and um, uh, scorpions and roaches and all kinds of possums eat a lot of roaches too, by the way. And so the Indians actually kept these as pets. And then later they would take the furs. So they would never kill the, the skunks. They would actually wait till they passed on as, as their pet. And then they would take the furs and then they would take the glands and they would boil these glands down and make them into a liniment for arthritis. And it actually worked really good. And up until the 1900s, so that was the last time skunk oil was actually used. And, um, uh, it was uh, $4 a gallon in Maine. That's the last state that actually sold uh, skunk oil. And um, now we use synthetic stuff, I'm the stuff in my hair from the, the, the tortoise cage. Um, so uh, they don't use that anymore. But what they do do is they take the glands and they make perfume out of it still. 
So if you use Chanel number no. five, you've just put skunk glands all over yourself. And then, and actually any perfume that's worth a lot of money is made from some kind of natural glands from some animal. If you paid less money, it's actually a synthetic. So it's not real glands. And we've got another question for you. Okay. Laura asks, how long does a skunk live? In the wild, they'll live uh, two to two, uh, they'll live four to six years in the wild. In captivity, they can live up to 10 years. The oldest skunk I've ever had was nine and a half. And so, and that one you know, passed away quite a few years ago. So yeah. So I don't know if y'all can see Klondike behind me. He's still eating his, his, <laughs> his food over there. Um, let's see, what else about skunks? Um, so if you see skunks with yellow on their hair, there's something wrong. They'll have worms or a liver issue. So usually they should have this stark white and the stark black. And um, yeah, and they're used for, their fur is very superior. It's really soft. And so a lot of times they're used in fur coats. Um, so there's actually farms up north that actually breed skunks in different colors and uh, they'll use them for fur coats. And so you can actually get these skunks as pets too in legal states. Texas is not one of them and have them as pets. They're the only the ones that are bred in captivity uh, that you can have as a pet with special permits in certain states. And like I said, Texas is not one of them. We do not have breeders in Texas and you cannot remove wildlife and keep it as a pet. That's completely illegal. Alrighty, uh, any other questions up to this point? What's our time right now? Um, we have six more minutes. Okay, well, I'm gonna bring another creature and let me, let me take everybody out of here because this other creature is not so friendly with these, these guys. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right, Klondike. You wanna say bye to everybody? <laughs> <laughs> he thinks I'm gonna take his swamp. We'll go in here. You got it, you're fine. You got juice off. No, you can't be on mommy's bed. You gotta go in here. <laughs> Klondike actually has his own gig going on right now, too. He's kind of a celebrity. All right. And you're going to like this last creature. And everybody's going to be scared of it because they don't understand this particular animal, but they're very, very important. So once Michelle shows us the last animal, we'll have a moment for questions. So just go ahead and start thinking of any questions you may have about any of the animals we've seen so far. Cookie, come on. Cookie. Come on, I want to introduce you. Okay, if you have a guess as to what that creature is, go ahead and put it in the chat. Anybody? Is that a squirrel? Is that a bird? Hello? Yes, <laughs> Meredith. Coyote. Cookie. Cookie. So that's Cookie. Uh, <laughs> Cookie likes to mark things. So she saw that there was a beaver there and now she's just made my bed her bed. So, <laughs> so Is there a reason um, she made so much noise? Yeah, because she was talking. So, <laughs> so whenever they talk, they're, they're very verbal animals. 
and when they get excited or happy, they start to verbalize. Sometimes it's just to tell the other guys that they're there to stay out of their territory, but in her case, she just is saying hi to us. Right, Cookie? You say hi? Woohoo! Yeah? You say hi to everybody? girl so cookie is actually um partially blind so she can't be released in the wild so that's why she's with us um she's very very human friendly um but the thing is coyotes only like their family so she thinks i'm her mother so i can't take her out around people because she's scared of them she just wants to be with her mother they live with their mothers for about two to four years the females sometimes stay forever with their mom but the males will stay a little bit until uh, you know, two to four years and then take off. Now, sometimes when the females, the, the daughters get a boyfriend, then they'll leave. But generally, they just stay with their parents. And there's two parents. Coyotes actually have the father actually helps raise the babies. And he'll stay for like eight years or longer with the uh, family uh, until the mom decides she wants a new boyfriend. Then dad has to go and they, she gets a new dad. Uh, but they're very, very uh, interesting, very close-knit animals. They're what's called the true pack animal, as opposed to even wolves. Everybody thinks that wolves are pack animals, but really, coyotes are the only ones that actually stick together for a long, long time um, and will take care of each other. Um, they're very, very interesting. They're very important because they eat rodents. They eat a lot of rodents. Uh, there's a book called Don Coyote, which is a takeoff of Don Quixote. Um, so it's a man uh, in the 70s. He was having, he's up in like Washington State or Oregon State. And he was having conflicts with other farmers that had cows that were killing the coyotes. And so what was happening was they were blaming the coyotes for killing all the baby cows. But what this man discovered is that they were putting down poison to kill the rodents and then the cows were eating this poison hay, and then the babies were born not so good, and the moms were not so good because they were basically poisoned also. So then the coyotes would take the, the baby that wasn't so great. So it was easy pickings whenever the baby's not being protected correctly by the mom. So what this man did was he put coyotes on his property. He stopped putting poison down and let the coyotes do their job of eating the rodents. So he didn't have to put down poison anymore because he had enough coyotes to take care of that problem. Once he stopped poisoning everything, his cattle got healthier. Coyotes were all over his property and they weren't eating the babies because everybody was healthier and taking care of the babies healthier and the babies were born healthier. So that's what's so nice about uh, having the coyotes on your property. They're very, very important. If you uh, shoot a coyote, like you, I'm sure you've heard of somebody telling you a story about killing a coyote. What they've done is they killed the mother or the father, right? They killed the mother. Is that what they would do? So if they kill the mother, then there's nobody to tell Cookie what to do because she's going to follow her mom for two to four years of what she's supposed to do. And so once you've killed one of their parents, they don't know what to do anymore, and they'll start doing crazy things like killing chickens and things like that. So you really have to leave the family intact in order for it to work. Was that a question? We have a question from Denise. She asks, do coyotes have predators? No, no, they do not. Now, a wolf will eat a coyote, but we don't have wolves in Texas. We used to have what's called a red wolf, but the red wolves and the coyotes really liked each other. And so uh, they got bred out. The other problem is humans killed enough of the red wolves for their furs that, that they, there's no longer any red, any, um, clear red wolves. I've gotten in two what I call koi wolves. So they're, they're more higher content of red wolf in them, but they're really a, just a coyote. But um, we had one that was really, really, really red uh, recently and we released them. We, we released those guys because we want that uh, back, back out in the population. Now, Cookie probably has no content of red wolf. She's, she's just a typical coyote. And um, let's see, let's turn. And as you see, um, they have very big snouts. They have very long necks. They kind of have, have a giraffe neck. So they have very, very long necks. And they also have no stop. They have hannies. 
it, even though it's like a paw, uh, it's almost like a hand. And when they walk, it's not like a dog. So if you look at paw prints in the wild, if you see a, what looks like a dog print, but it has nails showing, that's a dog. If it's got just the paw print, but not nails showing, that's a coyote. Because their nails don't go down on the ground. They actually use techniques of tiptoeing up on their prey. And so their nails don't click on the ground. And so that's kind of important for them. Um, their, their coloration is used for hiding in various types of areas. In her case, you know, it's kind of dry around here. So she's more brown and mottly to be in the drier brush type area. And um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else about Peggy with kids. Come here, come here, Cookie. Cookie monster, come here, right here. If you have any questions, go ahead and voice them in the chat. They're very mouthy animals. They will bite you terribly. Their teeth are made for shredding. And their paws are made for uh, shredding too, but not for digging so much. Um, what they'll do is when they kill their prey and they don't eat it all, they actually eat small meals, but more often. And so what they'll do is they'll eat a little bit, they'll bury it somewhere and they'll pee on it. And that marks their territory for nobody else to see this. This is my food, I've peed on it, so nobody else can eat it. Right? Yeah, I know, you do that all the time. <laughs> yeah, so she's, she can get about 40, 50 pounds. Um, she's, she's a little big for a coyote because she's in captivity and she's getting better food than she would out in the wild. But um, you don't have to be scared of coyotes. If you yell at them and run at them, you know, they usually will run away. They're not very aggressive. They're not into eating cats like everybody says because they're kind of scared of cats because uh, they're scared of everything, really. Um, but if they're stuck in an urban environment, like Meredith pointed out, animals in an urban environment are so much different. Um, so a coyote in an urban environment probably will pick off some of the cats because there's nothing else to eat and they really have to get uh, food. And what will happen is there's no rats to eat because everybody's poisoning them. So they've got to find something. Uh, Laura, what, did you, what do I feed Cookie? Uh, Cookie eats a balanced diet of meat and vegetables and fruit. So she's an omnivore. So she has to have everything. She doesn't just eat meat. Dogs are not meat eaters. They're an omnivore. A lot of people make a mistake of just feeding them meat. The only true carnivore around here are cats. And they're the only ones that can live strictly on just meat. Okay. So any other questions? And I can get Cookie to talk one more. All right. Okay. Any no questions? questions? This is the question time. No? Well, I hope you guys liked uh, everything I said and um, it made sense. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, let's close with Cookie um, and then I'll let you guys go. So Cookie, you want to say bye to everybody? Come here. Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! Tell them bye. Bye. Yeah, you tell them bye. No, over here. Oh, come here. Ooh. Cookie. What? 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 Oh. Oh. <laughs> like when she does that one. Okay, guys. Well, I'm going to sign off. And, Thank um, you so much, Michelle. You guys take care. This is Michelle's crazy life. <laughs> Do not get a coyote as a pet. It's completely illegal, by the way. And besides, <laughs> you don't want them peeing all over your house. Okay, take care. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. If you're interested in getting the slides from today's talk, please email us at admin at philhardburgerpark.org, and we'll send you a copy. We'll also post the slides with this video on our website next week. So if you're interested in learning more about Hardburger Park and the conservancy that supports it, please visit our website, which is philhardburgerpark.org. We are a member-based nonprofit that relies on donations to support educational activities in the park. So if you're able to give $5 or $10 to support programs like today's, we would really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Bye.